Good evening and welcome to another episode of Be Inspired, our weekly show showcasing the very best of British Bangladeshi talent and what an interesting show we have this evening. But before that, how's the weather treating you? For all the viewers that are in the UK, we're enjoying this amazing hot weather. It feels like it's going to melt us, but let's not complain because the weather will rapidly change tomorrow. So in the meantime, enjoy. Get yourself a glass of cold drink and wherever you're watching us around the world, I hope you've had a fantastic week. Stay with us for the next 40, 45 minutes where we will be discussing with another inspirational person in our community. Well, where do I start? Well, there's a really long list of things I could say about this uh, next guest, but let me start by saying her name is Rahima Begum. She's actually a professional artist, amazing artwork. Like every week I say, you'll get a chance to see her uh, a profile on social media. But before then, let me talk a little bit about her. So she's an artist by profession, doing some amazing illustrative work that I've personally have seen, children's storybooks and other amazing uh, work piece that she's been commissioned. And when she's not doing that, she is an amazing, her, she is a co-founder, I should say, of this amazing international charity uh, working with the most at need, uh, raising the issues of polite of the Rohingya Muslims. In fact, I know this because I was there in parliament. They, were, they are one of the first charity to raise the issue in the Western world of the Rohingya, uh, Rohingya community's plight. Well, it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce on Be Inspired, Rahima Begum. Rahima, thank you so much for joining us. I, I know I've just, I know before we start, I've just asked you to turn the fan off when you're uh, in your, in your uh, apartment. So I apologize for that. But I guess the 45 minutes that we're going to be talking, I hope, and I know people are not going to need a fan uh, to call them because you're going to really wow them with the stories that you're, you're, you've been so inspiring. So let's start with a, a, a longer introduction. Uh, from yourself about you and your work and your activism. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, honestly, it's, it's great to come on and, and speak to you and just speak to everyone about this. So, I mean, I think your intro was perfect, but um, uh, I'm from an organization called Restless Beings and we co-founded this uh, about a decade ago now. Um, and it was just, you know, honestly, I was I was fresh out of university and it was just, we, we had a sense of restlessness. You know, we felt like we could do more for communities that were struggling and that's kind of how the organization came about um, and yeah we've been running for 12 plus years now we work with marginalized and forgotten communities across the world or any community that doesn't have mainstream or media attention in the way that it should have um, and that's where we as an organization and as an agency um, step in so that's kind of what I do largely. Excellent so we, we will obviously uh, you know your you and your co-founder Mabru and the team became prominent to myself, um, you know, early years, um, many years ago, I should say, um, when you first did that big demo outside the Foreign Office, uh, trying to bring the awareness to the both the international community, but the British government, the British media about the Rohingya Muslim. So we will talk about that. But I think before I do that, I, I, I want to sort of touch on uh, the next chapter or the, what's pressing in a lot of people's mind at the moment is the Chinese Muslim, yeah. you know, the issues of that. Can you start off talking a little bit about, just to give a little, because obviously some people know about it, some people don't. It is a pressing matter, uh, if you're comfortable enough to sort of share the information. Yeah. I mean, the Uyghur issue is, uh, I'm glad you brought this up actually, um, it was a community that we started researching probably about 10 years ago and, you know, there was like a potential for us to have a project there, but we really wanted to take the time to investigate further and research, but it's an ongoing struggle and, uh, and I'm, I'm sure everyone who's watching knows about the Uyghur community and their struggle in China, it's an ongoing persecution, um, not just for their religious freedom, that's something that I kind of, every time I speak about the Uyghur community, I, as much as this just looks like a religious persecution, it's also a regional persecution as well. It's where they're based in China, what natural resources they have, you know, the ethnicity, their values, their cultural values. So it's a whole combination of things. And the Uyghur community and the Uyghur struggle has been ongoing. And it's something that I think, you know, as a mainstream public and international community, we really need to step up in terms of how we can support. Although it's a lot more dangerous in terms of how we can support and the climate and access into China in, in trying to support, it's one that at least from an awareness perspective we can we can do. So 
it, you know, it's this is one that's very close to my heart, and it's one that you know, I, I it's very difficult to stay hopeful for that community. Obviously, we know there are issues of you know um, revaluing um, the community, so they're being forced into camps where they're changing their religious values or making them think otherwise, getting them into more of a secular way of thinking, um, stripping them of their religious identity, um, taking mothers and children apart, putting them into different re-education, relearning camps. Uh, all of this is happening right now, but. It, we must bear in mind it's been going on for 50 plus years. Thank you very much for that. So I, I hope that gives you um, a sense of what Restless Being does. I mean, I'm very you know privileged to know this team. Uh, I was very honored to be in, invited to a, a, a special meeting with a group of exile. You know, I, I could never say it. Is it Uyghur? Uyghur, yeah. yeah. Uyghur, 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 yeah. yeah. The Uyghur, yeah, um, uh, a person who flew in from from France to, to speak to this was I must say this was before the COVID lo lockdown, and obviously um, you know I, I was almost in tears because you know the gentleman who spoke he's been a pretty much a spokesperson for them from France for many years um, for safety reasons I you know I'm not going to say more but you know to the point where before the lockdown he found out six weeks later that his father died like you know it took six weeks to even get the information out. Um, with COVID, you know, can you imagine the amount of people that have died locally? We know about, uh, and so what kind of uh, impact it's had. So thank you for sharing that, and I hope people that are watching uh, through this will will get a chance to go on what little information there is on social media, and maybe on Restless being uh, uh, social media sites, you'll have more. But let's go back to what brought you international attention, uh, and it's ongoing. Right. I mean, it is a hot weather in London and we've got chance to get a surf a cold drink and uh, we've got fan, we've got electricity and we've got all sorts of uh, options. But if you are one of those millions of Rohingya Muslims, they are all Muslims in, in, in a lot of ways, who've, who've swum, who've, who've, who've fled the jungles uh, across the border into the makeshift camps near Cox Bazaar, um, you've got nothing. But your dignity, your land, your 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 everything's been taken away from you by the you know the Rohingya military you know dictators that the people. How did you, as a young activist, become aware of that? And you know what, you know, made you go out there and and share that story with the rest of the world? Um, we. You know what? It was by accident. It was never a planned trip. We have a street children project in Bangladesh and we were made aware of. So a lot of communities often contact us. Um, they see us as a human rights agency that they can rely on or just sometimes just consult and just speak to. We listen, you know, where we can help, we help. We, it was through sort of an accident where we were like, we, we were aware that there were Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh, you know, this was a decade ago now, but they'd been, they'd been there for 22 plus years. Um, and we just wanted to see the conditions of those camps. And it was as simple as that. We made a trip 12 years ago to the southern parts of Bangladesh, Cox Bazar, and across that region um, to see what the state of the camps were like. And, um, as a result, we discovered that, you know, the camps were in really poor condition. Some of the refugees, and I call them refugees for this particular conversation, but really they are displaced, forced into statelessness. Mm. Um, this Rohingya community were in the camps. They'd been there for a long time, living in very, very, very difficult conditions. You know, often families of up to 10 people sharing one bowl of rice. And, and I'm serious, one bowl of rice. So what would happen if the elders would not eat for two, three days, the children would eat. And, and this was something that, we hadn't expected, considering this was, a, you know, an international refugee camp. It wasn't registered at the time when we initially went to visit. And then what we did is we produced an undercover documentary, and we then crossed the border into Burma, just that initial part of Burma, Burma, and we and continued with that documentary. And this was something that 12 years ago we then leaked to the mainstream press to show the real conditions on ground of what the Rohingya were suffering from within the camps, and also what they were suffering with on a daily in terms of within Burma and as they were crossing the border of Burma to get into Bangladesh for some respite, for some you know some sense of freedom to escape the struggles that they were facing in Burma. And this documentary was picked up by all the mainstream press, everyone from your CNN to Fox, um, to BBC, to The Guardian. And then as a result, it catapulted into what it is now, which is an international campaign. We were able to get the press interested, involved, engaged, and wanting to speak about this community, who prior to 22 years ago, I mean, there was no interest. There was no interest in this community who were being persecuted in Burma and crossing the borders into Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangladesh. And that's it, That re it really was by accident. I mean, obviously, this is a show that is supposed to inspire, and it is inspiring listening to you. But I have to ask a really difficult question. I mean, 
there's you know fresh out of university you and your you know friends um go out there do this amazing work i mean i have to ask you know there are i'm not naming them but we do know of some amazing international charities logos that reflect you know diverse and global and you know what i can think of one that has a barbed wire around a candle what are, what were they doing you know they were doing great work for in, within their respective frameworks they were doing good work so you know with no disrespect to all the international agencies that were present on the ground or the, they were doing the work i think where we had a vantage point was that you know, as a British Bangladeshi, as a Bangladeshi individual, for me, it was the ability to be able to be in Bangladesh and say, well, hang on a minute. Although I, you know, I might belong to a movement, you know, a new movement called Restless Beings, we're really interested, we're a group of activists. I'm going to go in with just heart, soul, compassion and curiosity. And that curiosity came from being a Bangladeshi, wanting to see, well, hang on, it can't just be a refugee camp for what it is. There must be more. You know, my co-founder was driven to investigate what the conditions were of the camps were like. I was driven to investigate where the women and children were hiding, where were they staying, where were they accessing food, where was the clean water from? And I think a combination of that curiosity and I guess being young activists, we didn't we, we we kind of ignored the frameworks of the international agencies and went went in as just human beings it really was that um i think where the international agencies at the time and and from experience i can say this now where they were failing is that they were not consulting with the local communities they were not investigating enough there were no journalists on ground it was us that who smuggled in the first set of guardian journalists and bbc journalists into certain parts of burma 12 years ago as, as young fresh out of university students just simply because we had documentation and i think that's the power is what you're able to capture at the right time and who you're able to speak to to do that. And I, I think that's where international agencies who were stuck within this strategy, within frameworks, within the right. bureaucracy, they were just slow in responding. We didn't care for any of that. For us, it was get it, get it up on social media, get the media on it. And I think we skipped certain steps. And as a result, I think we were able to get the news out faster. So I think that's what, where I would say, but I think, you know, with all respect, the international agencies are doing great work, but I think they were just not timely enough to, a decade ago. Well, I, I will say, you know, now that you've done a really good just um, in terms of introducing your Restless Being charity, it, the name fits purposely so well. You know, a, group, a bunch of university graduates um, coming out and thinking, you know what, we want to change the world. And you know what, 12 years later, I can I can say 12 years I've been following your work. That you have made a, a massive impact, both of the people that you're working for, but also people like myself and my kind of uh, group of friends that because we've become more aware of the work that you do and the plight of the communities that you are. So it's not just a, I mean, and also it's not a religious thing. I mean, you work across communities, cross borders. I mean, in Central Asia, yeah, I, I know, I mean, I can just go on, but I'm going to let you speak but about the work that you're doing. And then the innovative ways, I have to say, that you bring awareness. So it's not like, yes, we've done the serious thing in a suit and tie in parliament and we've done the debate and, you know, the number of, um, you know, these sort of special groups, interest group in parliament have listened to you. And I've, I've sat there marvel at, you know, all the MPs looking up you and Mabru, I should say at this point, your co-founder, when you've done your presentation, I thought, this is great. This is, this is Bangla power. But yeah. I enjoy also when you do your social events, you you know you do this cool vibe saturday events where people come a little bit of slow jam session and then you raise awareness so you kind of like you get a small bite of information you become curious and maybe you want to become an activist how did that become about is that sort of like you, you're just thinking you know what, i'm just going to bring some friends together and have fun but at the same time do some good work you know what um i, I love having you at, at, at our events you're like the first one who's shaking your head to the music and you're really engaged yeah, i'm the eldest that's why there <laughs> no, honestly it's brilliant you bring such a vibe and energy with you and honestly it's it really is you know it's exactly what you just said you said look you know you you help us raise awareness you 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 let us engage and i think ultimately we were really interested in ways in which we can communicate the work of activism and the the need for us all to want to make a difference in this world so the way the way we see it restless beings and and this is also my personal value is that okay yes i'm an activist you know i'm the co-founder of this international movement you know but 
activism and the work of you know doing something you know for the sake of supporting others across the world is something that we can all do regardless of where you are in, within your occupation but also how do we make it something which isn't so grim you know there are so many human rights abuses across the world there are so many issues it can get very heavy and sometimes what can happen is we as individuals can get exhausted with the bombardment on of information so how can we engage with all age groups how can we make it accessible how can we bring people into the work of of human rights into one Wanting to support people without it being overbearing and music theater and art is one of the big ways in which we do that so creativity is kind of at the center of a lot of what we do at restless being so like you said we do these slow jam nights we have music gig nights which attract students which attract you know mainstream public we have nights which are designed for, for our friends and family and it's all about bringing people together for the sake of the music for the sake of the theater for the art for the fun stuff but the moment they're there yes they've had a great night but if we can then instill some information in them about look, listen, guys, there's a human obligation that we all have, which is let's try and do something for the world. And that doesn't have to look like money. It doesn't have to be a donation. It can also be just resharing a tweet or a Facebook status. And, you know, just kind of bringing, you know, like you mentioned, the Uyghur community, the Rohingya community, these are, these are communities that often we don't talk about on the dining table with our kids, you know? It's not something that we might speak to over dinner on a Friday night with friends. Um, and so how can we introduce that as co topics of conversation? And if you do that through a music gig and someone walks away and they're like, I had a really good night, you know, I saw my favorite singer. And you know what? I also learned about this community. I'm gonna let my friends and family know about this community when I see them next. That for us is a major step in awareness raising and also changing the way in which the main mainstream public responds to human rights abuse. Uses. And that's kind of a large part of the work we do at Restless Beings. Yeah. Well, I was, I'm, I want to sort of finish this part of the conversation by saying, I mean, obviously the COVID situation has meant that we don't get a chance to socialize, but more importantly, um, your work through your um, online presence is there. So I hope people uh, are listening at home or wherever you are in the world that you'll get a chance after after uh, a show has finished that you'll go on, on the social media sites of Restless Being and look at the work they do. Yes. You know, next time there's a slow jam session, drop me a message. I'll I'll make you my plus one, maybe plus one thousand. But more importantly, you know, it is important that charities do get the support. And those of us are financially in a better position, um, you know, you might not be able to go out and seek this, uh, the kind of people who need help. But Restless Bees is doing that. So feel free to gener generously donate as much as you can. Thank you very much, Rahima. I, it sort of moves on swiftly to, you know, there's more to you. Then just your activism and your cool vibes on a Saturday a slow jam session. Professionally, you're like the most super talented artist. Get now, you. At this point, you know, this is not my regular Zoom meeting from work or the council stuff where I can I can share the screen. But I hope people get a chance to go on your Instagram pages and, and, and look at some of the amazing work that you've done. So from an early age, tell, to talk us about how you became this illustrative Quiz that you are. No, thank you. You're so kind. I'm like working on a new website for all my artwork at the moment. So this would be great. I'll definitely share it. And you could definitely see my stuff online. Um, but I've art's just been really important. You know what? It was always a hobby. So it was nothing that I pursued seriously from a younger age. I went in and studied literature and history. You know, I was like really active. I was volunteering for lots of charities. I was that sort of hippie at uni. I finished uni and it was all about restless beings, but I was always just on the side. So my first ever job was at SOAS University as a researcher. And That's I used to work- That's you started as well, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, honestly, it was it was just there, but I think I, I always felt that this was something that I wanted for it to become my main occupation for something that would actually, you know, take over a big chunk of my life. And so about seven years ago, I, I took a big step and I was like, right, okay, you know, Restless Beings is my baby. It's something that I'm always going to do, but let me actually do something for myself, which I truly love that I can hopefully maybe, if it works, transform into my occupation. And, you know, by the grace of God, alhamdulillah, it worked. Um, so yeah, I always illustrating. I'm, I'm that person that, you know, during meetings, you know, we're talking about about, I don't know whatever it is financial budgeting I'm at the edge of the page you know drawing and thinking about my next painting and so that was it I started off like you know as a teenager selling my artwork in market stalls and you know that I'd be so happy if I sold something for 50 pounds I'd be like yay you know as a 15 year old and so whereas now over time what I do now is commercial art so I do uh, illustrations for children's books adults fiction non-fiction I do um, interior design consultancy with like restaurants um, I work on commercial art so and I also do things like when a business 
business wants a large painting for you know their offices you know they'll contact me and i also do private commissions for people so i love what i do you know um and it's my bread and butter so it, it's great to be able to do this Excellent. Well, look, it's interesting you talked about SOAS, you talked about, uh, you know, finding yourself a university. You know, um, this is a very difficult year. A lot of A-level students are going to get their results without actually setting their exams. You know, those who are happy will be happy. Those who are upset because they didn't get the grades they were expecting. Um, you know, this is a, a moment where I think it'll be really useful because A, you work, you're, I mean, obviously uh, a very young in terms of, you know, experience of university. And you work with a lot of young people as in, you know, who are at university or part of your restless team. Um, if I could maybe ask you to indulge and give some tips, because like you said, you did a, a degree in uh, in literature and so forth, but you're now an artist. Yeah, you're a, an international uh, activist, right? So, you know, as much as, you know, I don't want people to shy away from a, your kind of your traditional degrees, but it's about also looking at yourself and think, you know what, I'm a, I'm really passionate about media or I'm passionate about sports. And I really don't want to be a doctor. Nothing wrong with lawyers. I mean, I I, I quite like lawyers, but you know, um, what, what 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 advice could you give to that? Well, the thing is, even though I studied literature, it's crazy how although I'm in a completely different field with my art and within my um, international activism work, I studied post-colonial history for my master's, post-colonial history and post-colonial literature. And it's so strange because now, all these years later, you know, like I'm in my mid thirties now, um, some of the things okay, that I- you're no longer, you're no more than 25, Rahima. Oh, no, 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 I should have, I should have said that now, right? <laughs> but just to kind of, you know, for, for, for any young people watching this, honestly, it's strange how something that you study now, even if you, you know, you, you want to be a basketball player, but you're studying medicine right now, you, it'll be interesting how it creeps into your career later. So my my you know degree and my master's in post-colonial history and how the British and the Portuguese occupied and what happened and how India and Bangladesh and, and Pakistan found its independence, that now helps me just make certain decisions within my activism and how I look at the world. So it will really, really, really benefit you later, regardless of what, it, what, what you're studying and which career you end up with, there'll be something from your degree that you'll find later on in your life that, that works. But one of my biggest bits of advice to any young people right now is we're all in a really unique time right now i mean when was the last time something like this happened where we all kind of froze you know as an international community um with this global pandemic and i think this is a great time for all young people who have had their life paused their studies paused they can't go back into you know university as normal within term time and in september to really reflect on exactly what you just said on where are your skill sets you know whatever it is that you're studying where are your real skill sets and what is it that you want to do going forward and if you don't know that's okay maybe you just enjoy you know maybe you want to kind of start your own business this is a really good time to get that skill set together and think about that business maybe you're really happy with the degree that you're doing and you know you're doing a law degree degree you know exactly where you want to be you know you want to be a barrister in a few years time this is your line of line of duty but think about maybe ways in which you can be introspective look at the things that you really enjoy what helps you shape you as a person how can you be the most authentic lawyer or barrister or engineer or artist or whatever it is possible and you can only do that by really figuring out who you are as a person and what helps you switch off what helps you switch on and i think this is the time for young people to do that instead of really worrying so much about you know what books do i need to read to you know get ahead of term time yes of course that's important but you won't get this time back you know and this is the best time to reflect on those areas i think because it'll shape you later for sure Thank you for that. Um, and, and that was really helpful. And as I said, um, for all our younger viewers, for or those adults who's with children, you know, there are, we have a cross spectrum of people who watch our shows. Um, this is a really valuable advice, you know, for both for your siblings or your your relatives, your your young children, but also for the young person who's who's thinking about university or even a second year at university. You know, do I really hope you take what uh, Rahim has said, Rahim. Let's talk a little bit more about this amazing co-founder, the other dynamic duo in this in this chain. I'm sure he's somewhere there. Hopefully, he's, he's doing the dishes as we speak, or, or preparing the evening meal, I should say. Um, <laughs> my brew. I mean, it is. It, it's no secret now that you both are the co-founders. You both are husband and wife. Um, God, it was. I, I, it was a day like this. I think you got married. I remember all these years ago. I, you know. Um, yeah. It must be great because he's also professionally a teacher and an academic. You know, he, he does his day job, and then you get together to do this 
um, project. It reminds me of someone like I know, you know, we all have different lives and we get together once a year to do, but you do it every day, you know. Absolutely. It, it's it's how do you go about choosing um, i'm going back to sort of your activism how do you go about choosing a project or a community you know how do you both as co-founders you know decide or who's going to get your time because you know your time is precious um it's interesting i mean it's obviously we have a, a wonderful team you know we have a regional team in the uk of about 15 members we have a small team in Singapore, we have a team in Bangladesh, you know, we have sort of ambassadors across the world that work for Restless Beings and that are volunteering. And so we have an incredible, we call it like a web of people who are supporters or, you know, consulting with us all the time, sharing their ideas. And so sometimes our job is, you know, is made easier because we have this wonderful team and we're able to hash out ideas and people make great suggestions or are in touch with communities and they're like, look, we can step in, we can support this community, we have the resources. So that kind of helps with our decision decision process but I think obviously you know we're married we're also co-directors uh, we co-founded this organization all those years ago and we were best friends um, it, it does help because we have that sort of ability to come to an understanding come to a middle place but we are not similar by any by any respect we are you know completely op complete opposites in our opinion very strongly opinionated you know there are times we'll spend a whole day debating about whether we should work with this particular community and where our resources are at and then come to some sort of decision. So yeah, it comes with its challenges, but I think it helps that um, ultimately we have one core value system when it comes to supporting the communities that we do is when communities contact us, we are a small grassroots organization. Yes, we have a huge international kind of web and impact, but ultimately in terms of where our resources lie, we are a small grassroots organization. And so we're aware of what our limitations are. So when a community contacts us and we're not able to support right now, we keep a healthy relationship with that community, like a friendship, which develops over time. And so when we are able to support, we step in as soon as we can. And I think kind of, that's our value system. If that community is marginalized, if all their rights are denied or they don't have access to justice and, you know, according to the UN Declaration of Rights, they don't have their basic rights of freedom in place, it becomes very easy to know when to support. Um, and I think as long as me and Mara can come to the middle on this, yeah, it works. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, you know, some people some people dispute about when to go shopping, what to, but you guys are disputing about who in the world to save, which is amazing. Well, look, um, for those of you who have just tuned in, it's almost 30 minutes into the show. Uh, you're watching Be Inspired with me, Abdullah, talking to the wonderful Rahima Begum, uh, co-founder of Restless Being. Thanks to you all for your positive comments over the last many weeks that we started the show. And our plan is to do a weekly show going forward. So once again, thanks to our wonderful sponsor j4s securities for supporting and podcast technicians and team behind the screen who are putting this on together every week for us so stay tuned um Rahima, let's talk a little bit more about you so um normally i sort of in the beginning i say obviously we, we know about your university life take us back to school life or sort of early you know where did rahima interest on things come about let's talk rahima the early years um, so, you know, honestly, I'm just from a regular working class, Muslim family, you know, migrant parents, growing up in East London. So my dad, you know, came here back in the 70s. My granddad came before that. And so for me, you know, life was as it was, you know, I, I'm from East London. I love being a Londoner, I love my home. And so my little life as a teenage Rahima was in Newham, you know, going to Plashet Secondary School, an all girls school. We had a female head teacher, Mrs. Nazir. Oh, I know her quite well, Miss uh, Bushra. Yes, uh, Bushra. Yeah. And yeah. so, I think, you know, honestly, I must give all credit to her um, because imagine going into year seven. And, you know, now we hear conversations all the time on Instagram where a lot of younger people say, well, actually, I don't see role models like myself. So I don't see enough colored women or I don't see enough, um, you know, Muslim women or Hindu women or Jewish women or whatever. I want to see role models that are have some similarities and that would inspire me and we hear lots of conversations about this now amongst the young community but growing up as a year seven student you know i went into this school and my head teacher would come in with a shalwar kameez on every day you know and her hair plaited and you know this was a, a pakistani woman you know who was incredibly you know um ambitious you know and inspiring head teacher so i think those stepping stones were in place you know i had you know a role model at, at secondary school who was my own head teacher who i thought wow this is so cool this is also you know a woman from a, a working class family you know um 
a family that worked really, really, really hard to get to where they are. So I think, you know, in that sense, it was great. I had very sort of open-minded parents at school as well. My parents were like, yeah, do what you love, just do it well and stay focused and, and be honest with yourself. And so I think in that sense, I, I never really had to go through that. Um, oh, you have to be a doctor when you grow up or an engineer um, that you grow up that I, I know a lot of South Asian and East Asian families go through. And so I think that was, you know, um, a great thing, but also problematic too, because that meant I had too many options. I was like, whoa, what do I do? So one year, year seven, you know, I wanted to be a fashion designer. By year eight, I want to be a gardener. By year nine, you know, so that can be a bit of a, um, but secondary school Rahima was, I was curious, constantly drawing. I think I was a bit of a brat, but I think in terms of my, compassion and hemp you know sort of empathy i am i still am till this day i'm very sort of passionate about environmental rights you know if i wasn't doing what i'm doing now i probably would have been a botanist i'm really interested in plants and plant life and you know botany in general so i think that kind of came about in secondary school as well and so yeah that, that was me you know i was just I, maybe no, sorry, I just wanted to bring because obviously a lot of people one of the things about this show is that yes we get the the serious stuff out of the way, which is you know why you are an inspiration, a person. That's why you're on this show. But people also who don't necessarily know you well, as you know, some do or I do, obviously, um, it's good to get that story about how it all evolved. You know, evolved. And it's funny you mentioned Miss Bushra. I mean, I still call her Miss Bushra. You know, um, we 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 used to sit on an education community looking at uh, BME communities in London many years ago, and she was an inspiration. Like you said, you know, she she would turn up to the meeting in like, you know, your normal sewer kameez your mum would wear, and and she would talk in a, a strong accent, but a, a you know, a, a very well, well spoken, uh, and she was a breast of fresh air. I think she had a sister as well, it was also very uh, inspirational. So I'm really glad that you brought her name, because you brought memories of me also feeling very inspired by her achievement uh, and the contribution she made to London life and education in particular. Uh, excellent. Um, let's talk a little bit about you know, you, you talk about plants and you talk about environmental. I mean, we want to sort of tie up with the COVID, right? So we we are, we are all in lockdown. Um, obviously, you're not able to fly around the world and save people and do things and raise awareness, but you've been doing using it through the social media. What have you been doing in the meantime? So we know you're passionate and you're a professional artist. Have you been doing any new artworks? Have you got new master, you know, stuff that you, you want to hang up on the wall somewhere? I'm, I'm working on a small collection. So like COVID is strange. Honestly, we had a couple of trips lined up for work, um, you know, and just it was important for us to get back into the camps and carry on with some of the work. So we have a Rohingya Women's Centre with two children's centres within the camps. So, you know, annual visits are incredibly important. And so, and also we have projects in Punjab and Assam working with farmers and citizenship rights. So we had some work trips lined up. So it was, it was really, um, you know what, brother like it was it was quite frustrating initially because everything just got cancelled all the conferences all our events our annual event we had a bollywood themed event this year everything's cancelled and so i guess you know it, it's been a lot of working from home i've been growing tomatoes so that's been great um and that's been a lot of sort of like i have a small balcony so it's a lot of balcony gardening um and just generally in terms of art i have i'm working on a small collection at the moment of paintings and i was hoping to finish this and exhibit it at the end of this year like a solo exhibition um but i think it'll be next year at some point so i am working on a small collection of paintings um nice. but covid's been strange you know i've just been eating lots look at my cheeks yeah that's, that's well, I, I, I don't know. I was going to say, is is Mabru a good chef? Uh, uh, I'm just, better I'm just... than me. He makes the meanest Bangladeshi fish curry and lamb chop curry. Oh my goodness, Good. he's a much better cook than I am. All right. Well, to tell him to get the tomatoes really ripe and ready, and I'm happy to do a social distance in Dawat. Um, yeah. I mean, I've been promising to come around for so so long, but we just okay. never had a uh, had a chance. Um, I'm coming to the end of the show, but you know, um, you you did some really valuable advice for the young people around you know, choosing a career path. Um, someone watching at home, restless as you were uh, 10, 15 years ago, um, what can you say to them to say, you know, if there's a topic you feel, you know, I mean, obviously the Black Lives Matter has been very prominent in, in the last few months. I mean, just recently the issues around police harassment in London is still prevalent, you know, 20 years later since post McPherson. And um, what can you say to them to kind of, I suppose inspire or get them to get off the sofa uh, and and pick up the the Twitter account and start raising awareness. Um, I would say find your power. So 
everyone, like I said earlier on, you know, we have it within us as, as human beings, as stewards of this planet to do more than just survive, to just, you know, to work, come home, sleep, eat, you know, be with our family. That's wonderful. And that's the main sort of basic foundation. But there is that little bit more. And so I would say find your power. And that would look like something like if you're a young person or, or not, you know, just any member of public who might be watching this, I would say, look at the people around you, your local, your, that's your community, be your friends, family, your neighbors, that's your community. That is your starting point. So whatever human rights issue that you're passionate about, you know, and of course, as you mentioned, the Black Lives Matter movement at the moment and police brutality, which has been something that's been ongoing for years and has actual colonial, you know, imperialist roots, do your research, look at your community, your friends and family, and find ways in which you can engage with them to begin with. If you're on social media, you're already a step ahead. So you're already speaking to a wider audience. Find ways in which you as an individual, and don't worry about whether it sounds right or uses the right terminology, speak in the language that you're most comfortable with, in the way that you're most comfortable with, and speak about these issues, because you'd be really surprised how you impact your community the moment you just start speaking, um, be it over a dinner table, be it over you know, Facebook. Um, and and that is what we call the ripple effect, which is the first step towards making change. And the more and more that we all do this, what would happen as, a, as an overall community, as a nation, as an international community, change starts from those conversations. So that's kind of what I would say. And I think this is a really good time to do it, especially as we have more, times on our, more time on our hands. Excellent. That's really valuable advice. Um, I don't know, over to you really to sort of share some, maybe called some cooking tips, some play, how to start a new pet portrait, what's the best? I mean, it's really about conversing. So, I mean, I want to finish the show. I've got another four minutes, but I want to finish the show talking about the, the illustrative work that you've done, the children book. So someone asked, you know, thinking, okay, which one did, did you do? Give us a couple of samples and how is the idea about your story and the pictures? You know, how do you link it up? So I want, I want to finish by on an artistic version. No, this is great. Um, so I work on like fiction and nonfiction. So sometimes when clients contact me, they might have a publisher or there might be, a, you know, independent author publishing for the first time. So an example of a, a book I did for, um, I don't know if everyone is aware of a company called Desi Dolls and what they do is they produce yeah, very much. Yeah, so they produce, you know, things like a dua pillow or um, a book for Ramadan. So I worked on a Ramadan dua book last year um, with that company, and it just has a combination of duas that are suitable for young children to read during Ramadan. And it has a sound panel, so you can press it, and you can actually hear the dua in both Arabic and also the translation in English. So when a client like that contacts me, we go through like a consultation period, and then what I would do is do a first draft. So I would draw the entire book out. They would give me the manuscript, and I would draw it out completely, just in pencil, and then. From there, we develop a story. And then eventually I would, um, so I'm a traditional illustrator in the sense that I don't do a lot of digital work. It's a lot of my work is, um, you know, hand on paper. So I would do, you know, oil paintings, watercolors, Indian ink, black and white, um, and a lot of authors like this. So if you grew up reading Roald Dahl books like myself, um, then the illustrator Quentin Blake is a traditional artist or a traditional illustrator who draw directly um, um, ink on paper. So that's the kind of work that I do. And then, yeah, it takes up to to almost three months to produce one children's book, a standard children's book. Um, and it's great. Honestly, I really love getting contacted by authors or anyone who just wants a personal illustration and because they have a story to tell and then, you know, we kind of exchange ideas and it's like two creatives coming together, you know, on the table and then producing something new and then seeing the interaction from young people or adults. Um, I, I did a, a, a fiction a non-fiction illustration book for um, a self-help book. So it was like, you know, trying to encourage um, adults to do more yoga and things like that. So that was the most recent thing that I did, which was, it was pretty hilarious. So I had to sit there doing live drawings of people doing yoga positions, you know, uh, but it was good fun. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that I get to do. And, you know, it's, it's a blessing. Honestly, God has been really kind to be able to allow me to do this and make a living from it as well. So it really helps. Excellent. Well, I, I, I do know of the couple who run the Desi Doll and, and I, I didn't know that you did that. So I won't name the, the, the supermarket brand that I was walking past and I, all the children were, were pressing those things. And obviously, non-Muslim children are equally uh, having access to those uh, um, products and so forth. So, Rahima, um, you know what? You know, because we know each other and we do have a giggle every now and then, unfortunately, the time has reached almost 40. But you know what? I really know... Like, obviously, I want to come back and do another show, hopefully with my brew in it. And by the way, brother, you know what? I, this is not, I'm not picking uh, Rahima over you. It's just that, you know, uh, we, we chose Rahima, but we will get get a chance to speak to my brew. He's shy. He's glad. 
I know, I know, I know. Um, thank you so much for your time. But, you know, as I said, it's been great talking to you. It's amazing the work that you've done. And as you said, you're only <clears throat> so age at that age and you've achieved so much and especially especially around raising awareness for people who've been suffering for 20 30 decades you know 50 years the persecution of the rohingyas have been going for so many years the the chinese muslim community that we we uh, you're going to help me with the, the uyghur community um you know they've been suffering is but it's because of the work that you do you're raising the awareness um and you know the advice you can give to the young generation as in without patronizing that if you feel young and feeling restless pick up a social media engage with the community it can start locally right bring the change to you locally we've got enough issues in our own doorstep from our local Same. council our local police our local mps our government uh you know look at the issues that we are now facing you know it absolutely belies you know uh, breaks my heart to see those people trying to cross in a small dinghy across the channel over here. So, you know, get involved. Um, Rahima, uh, it's 40 minutes. It's been great talking to you as ever. Look forward to seeing you uh, whenever you do the next social jamming or whenever we get together again. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Uh, friends, thank you so much for watching us again on Be Inspired. Until next week, stay well, stay tuned. Good night.